Have there been objects that didn't match the environment? Phone booths, college campuses, a lot of turtles, too many turtles, a number of turtles that makes you think, why? Why turtles again? Turtle? Turtles. Turtle, turtle, turtle. Turtles. Turtles. Turtle, turtles. Turtle, turtles. Turtles. Turtle. Turtles. Infinity Train is a show with a lot of subtext and symbolism. From the names of the characters, to the scenery, to the backgrounds, to even the technology presented in the background as details. With this show, it's never a bad thing to think deeply about even the smallest of details. After all, doing so may allow you to predict what's coming next. However, today we're not trying to predict anything. Rather, we're set out to explain how the train works, at least while it was under Amelia's control, point out the small yet crucial details that you probably missed, go even more into depth with Amelia's character, and answer one of the most pressing questions that was on everyone's mind through all of books one and three. That being, why turtles? And as a secondary question, yet perhaps more thought-provoking, would it ever be possible for Amelia to bring Ulrich back if she was given the proper time and instruction? Now obviously, we're getting into major spoiler territory here. If you haven't seen books 1, 2, and 3 of Infinity Train yet and would like to, now is your chance to click off the video. If not, you've had your warning. Oh, you put a lot of thought into your designs. This is just how it is. In Book 1 of Infinity Train, it's revealed that the antagonist, Amelia Hughes, took over the train from 1-1, the true conductor. She did so because the train had the ability to create something from nothing, and she believed that she could use it to bring back her dead husband, Ulrich Timmons. 1-1 refused to help her in this task, so she took things into her own hands. Her secondary goal beyond bringing Ulrich back was to create the old university campus in which they attended engineering school, so that they could spend the rest of their lives there unbothered by the problems of the real world. Said problems heavily relating to the time period in which Amelia grew up in, which was very misogynistic and highly based on traditional values. I do have a video on that that I'll be linking in the info card about her feminist arc and how she, as a character, is very heavily tied to the women's rights movement of the 1970s. It's pretty interesting, and I recommend watching it if you haven't already, as it will give you better context to the rest of this video. But all of this doesn't really get to the point, does it? Like, yeah, we know why she was doing these things, and we know what her end goal was. But why do all of Amelia's creations involve turtles? Well, Amelia actually gives us that answer herself, though I do think that when she did, it was more of a moment of realization for her. Of course, the turtles! It was just a stupid handkerchief. The answer here is fairly simple, though what isn't simple is just how deeply this rabbit hole actually goes. And it's a lot, as I'm sure you can see from this runtime, so please just bear with me for this. The reason why all of Amelia's creations involve turtles and turtle imagery is because of a simple and seemingly throwaway detail of a turtle patterned handkerchief that we see in the episode The Past Car. The reason that everything she creates has turtles in it, including the denizens of said car, is because it's the focal point of the memory she was basing her creations off of. She was trying to recreate her old university campus based on how she remembered it from their graduation day. And that's why all of her creations are centered around turtles, since she's focused on recreating that memory specifically. It's likely that if there were another animal on that handkerchief instead of turtles, that that animal would end up being the new theme of the car. For example, if that pattern was a cat pattern, you would have a cat kingdom rather than a turtle kingdom, and so on and so forth. However, symbolically, turtles make the most sense for Amelia regarding her arc and overall character type. While people often think of turtles as being wise animals and being a symbol for knowledge, symbolically, they may also represent someone who feels the need to hide away in their proverbial shell and isolate to protect themselves from being hurt. Amelia seems to be someone who doesn't really care for human contact or interaction, and even went so far as to reject the help from her friends that came to check in on her before before Ulrich's funeral service. She was alone for at least 33 years and doesn't really seem to be in a rush to make new friends or form new relationships. So as far as why turtles make sense for her symbolically, that's that nailed down. As far as we know, the train is incapable of creating a perfect one-to-one -one replica of a human person, but it isn't incapable of creating animals, or later, denizens loosely based on a pre-existing person and their memories. So because it couldn't create what she wanted directly, it defaulted to the next closest thing in her memory. And since the turtle handkerchief was in her direct line of sight, since she was using it to wipe Ulrich's face, turtles became the target of creation. But it wasn't just the turtles that the train picked up on when it came to the car creation. It seems as though all of her memories were free real estate, even if she wasn't focusing on them directly. As it seems all the passengers' memories were, to be completely honest. 
While memory replication seems to be how Amelia tried to create her cars, I have a feeling that 1-1 one, one and the train use a similar method, albeit more accurate. In book two, Cracked Reflection, we see a passenger memory farm of sorts. There's these robots called porters that harvest your memories and turn them into tapes that can be played back and watched in real time. Your tape is what determines how high your number is and what your problem that you need to work through is. But I have a feeling that it serves another purpose. In order for the train to be effective, it needs to force you to work through your very specific issue. The train knows what that problem is based on your tape. One one has the ability to move through and control tapes, so it's likely that he also uses passenger memories while creating train cars and denizens. This would allow the train to directly challenge you with a personalized journey, crafting both denizens and cars that fit your lived experience. That, or knowing where to place you in a pre-existing car based on your memory of the location that you first boarded the train in. So for example, Tulip waking up in the snow car while she was running away in Wisconsin while it was snowing out. So at first, she thought that she had just passed out while in the woods, rather than having been transported to an entirely different realm of being. Or how Jesse's first car was a grassy area with a lot of hills, when the area he had run away from was an area outside that was also grassy with a lot of hills. And this seems like an ordinary shared experience, since Simon also stated that he didn't know he was on the train at first either. This allows new passengers to acclimate to the situation, rather than waking up and automatically being shocked while surrounded by mythical and potentially dangerous creatures. Amelia's cars are understandably far less organized and put together, simply because she isn't either 1-1 one -one or the train which is a machine and hadn't perfected the method yet. She was likely basing her creation of cars off of the trial and error methodology, rather than following a set of written instructions. But if you think about it, how else would 1-1 one, one or the train know how Earth is and how to replicate realistic environments while adding in fantasy elements and themes? Neither 1-1 one, one or the train, depending on who creates the cars, has a human experience because they're not humans. They would need to base them off of memories, since both the train and 1-1 one, one themselves isn't off the train and experiencing Earth or the human experience. So they use the experience of others to either loosely or literally create cars that they think would be familiar enough to the point where passengers aren't going to freak out and not want to go any further. For example, the Lucky Cat car and the Banking car are perfect examples of ordinary human locations being combined with minor fantasy elements. But this is me basing this entire theory off of one piece of evidence that, while makes sense, doesn't solidify anything. As Amelia says, it's just a stupid handkerchief. However, I literally have four pages of additional evidence that I think does a pretty good job of adding more substance to this theory. Hopefully you'll be convinced because some of these details are a little too specific for the answer to be anything else. You built that weird car with the turtles in it! And this is your college campus! You're trying to make a car of your old life! Of course I am! So while trying to prove my point for this theory, I needed to watch through the unfinished car literally frame by frame multiple times because of just how much callbacks there were to the episode The Past Car. There's also quite a few hints in book three, and I'm sure loads more that I missed despite looking through everything multiple times. It was also difficult to tell whether or not something was a reference simply because we don't have the full context to Amelia's arc, such as how Ulrich died, for example. I feel like if we knew that, it would be much easier to point out and put context to some of the details that I've noticed. And no, we're not counting Owen's jokey answer of him dying in a dirt bike accident. Y'all need to stop asking him what happens to characters off of the train, by the way, because anything he says at this point is canon because it can't be proven otherwise by future installments, and you're making his chaotic energy way too powerful. We don't need a repeat of Hazel and the Inside Out car. Anyways, I feel like it will probably just be easier if I go through everything that I found in relation to comparing the past car to the unfinished car, since this is where I've found the most direct reference. References. I'll leave the timestamps in the pinned comment, so feel free to go through on your own scavenger hunt and find these details without me pointing them out to you directly. The first memory recreation that I'm pointing out is one that's very obvious and in your face. The phone booth. In the past car, Amelia and Ulrich make a phone call to get a taxi because it's raining. You can see that exact same phone booth in the unfinished car 46 seconds into the episode. And while a phone booth seems to be a regular and non-specific detail that can be derived from any passenger's memory, the next detail's not. Aloysius, the Turtle King, actually has some very specific details to make you aware that he actually has some attributes influenced directly from Amelia's memory. Not only is he a turtle, which as we established earlier is derived from her university memory, but he actually shares a voice actor with Ulrich. Both Ulrich, Amelia as the conductor, and Aloysius are voiced by Matthew Rise. It's more difficult to point this out with the conductor, but not nearly as difficult when comparing Ulrich's adult voice to Aloysius's. 
Naturally. We can show you to the other door, but pray tell, who is your little friend dismantling our turtle totter? <laughs> no change to call a cab, love. It is I, your normal boyfriend. I am a human. This would have been so much easier for all of us if you had just stayed put. But that's not the only quality that the royal reptilian got from Amelia's broken psyche. He also wears Ulrich's glasses, and his crown looks like it's made of spoons, specifically the type that was seen in an earlier flashback scene of Amelia and Ulrich's childhood. Their names are also both of German origin, Ulrich literally meaning noble or regal ruler, and Aloysius meaning famous warrior. It's possible that the train took Ulrich's name literally, creating a royal turtle because of both the meaning and Amelia's targeted memory, including turtle imagery. So you could see how Turtle Ulrich translated to Turtle King in train language, since the fantasy element needed to be included somewhere. And since the train does not fully recreate the dead, it needed to do something with that information. Though it is terrifying that she was able to replicate his voice in other aspects of him, and I'm sure if she knew just how close she was, it would be more difficult for her to actually pull away from her seemingly impossible task and return to her somber reality. The spoon weapons that the turtle guards are holding as well is the same spoon Ulrich used to eat jam in the childhood flashback in the past car. Some of the armor designs also seem to be derived from the spoon, since it seems to be a nonsense decorative texture that can be found at the handle. And this isn't the only reference to the jam eating scene that we have, if you can believe it. There's also the whole jam pond aspect of the car, which is actually pretty in your face, as it becomes a focal point when Tulip cleans it up and causes a traffic jam. Haha, <laughs> get it? traffic jam. Anyways, the jam that's being used in the pond is actually the same condiment that Ulrich is seen eating in the same memory that includes the spoon. However, this isn't the only place that we've seen the jam itself before. There's also a scene later in the background of the past car where both Amelia and Ulrich are eating the grape-flavored topping together, which is also where this detail could be derived from. The further we get into this video, the more you'll notice that it's a theme for extremely small details like this to affect the overall composition of the car. There's also an elementary classroom that can be found in the unfinished car near identical to their childhood classroom that can be seen in Amelia's tape. There's not much else to say about this really, it's more or less the fact that it was a shared location between the scenes. Similarly, you can find a bunch of scattered apples on the background table in one scene, which are in direct reference to the apple that was seen on the teacher's desk in that same memory. But that's not even where the childhood classroom references end, because one of the more subtle inclusions is actually from the whoopee cushion, which I would argue is a focal point for that episode outside of the jam. The whoopee cushion is included in the clock fixture directly before the exit of the car. It's only decorative, but it's still there and presented in a fairly direct way. This memory was important to Amelia because it involves Ulrich sticking up for her, and so it makes sense that it would be shown directly and less in the background elsewhere in the car. Now this is where we start to get a little bit more obscure in our references, and where some of the stuff that you probably haven't noticed yet comes in. If you thought we were done, you're sorely mistaken because I haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. About 2 minutes and 56 seconds into the unfinished car, you can spot flags with odd symbols on them. If they look familiar, it's because we've seen these exact same symbols before in the past car. They're in direct correlation to the game that Ulrich is playing, being gems that his character needs to collect to win the game. Also in reference to this memory, at 5 minutes and 2 seconds into the unfinished car, you can find the decorative sci-fi looking glasses that Ulrich was wearing in the background of a scene hung up. At 6 minutes into the past car, Amelia asks Ulrich to marry her and says, So? What do you think? This quote can be found on a building in the unfinished car. This isn't the only quote that we can find from this scene on a building, however, as Amelia's goofy pronunciation of the word human from that exact same scene can be found on a building as well. Cute man. Cute man. Going a bit out of order here because I want to save the best for last, we're going back to the graduation ceremony next. Now, these memories are perhaps what overshadowed most of the smaller memories that were included in this car, perhaps because the car itself was based off Amelia's university, and so the similarities were easier to notice. For example, her old university archway is half-created, sporting only half of the quote that it does in her actual memory. It says, wear great minds, and then cuts off, whereas the full quote from her college campus states, where great minds become the greatest minds. It also obviously doesn't include the turtle cap and gown statue, but that's besides the point. You also see graduation cat birds flying throughout the car as part of its local fauna, which is in direct reference to the scene where they throw their caps up upon completing their graduation ceremony. So with most of the major scenes out of the way, I want to do a quick rapid fire round before I get into the more major discoveries that I made, because there's going to be a lot of discussion around those specifically. Some of these actually occurred in book three, so I'm just going to list them off as simple observations with little to no explanation since they don't really need any. In the unfinished car at 7-Eleven, Kevin the Turtle is wearing the same tie as Ulrich at 4.40 in the past car. 
At 105 in the Unfinished Car, there's a reference to the Duckboat Amusement Park ride that Amelia and Ulrich rode together, which you can see in the past car at 732. At 552 in the Unfinished Car, a turtle is hanging up the same colored clothes that Amelia and Ulrich are wearing at 5 minutes into the Unfinished Car. At 721 in the Musical Car, Kevin the Turtle is wearing a Kiss the Shelf apron, in direct reference to the Kiss the Chef apron that Ulrich wears at 732 into the past car. 650 into the musical car, there's an ice cream turtle stand which is referencing the ice cream stand that can be seen at 732 into the past car. In the grid car at 509, Ulrich's hat can be seen on one of the snowman's heads. At 315 in the unfinished car, there's a turtle in flight director clothing in reference to Amelia and Ulrich being at the airport in the past car at 732. In the unfinished car at 721, the quote, but it'll be good to go is seen on a building which is pulled from the funeral service seen at 641 in the past car. Look, I know it's hard. But we'll be good to go. At 526 in the unfinished car, there's an A on the mailbox that could be referring to Amelia and Ulrich's shared first initial and the fact that they live together. And that's the end of the rapid fire round. Speaking of which is a little detour, most of these callbacks I was only able to notice because Riley from my Discord server actually found some of the full images from a crew member's portfolio site. So it made pointing out these details a little easier, since as you can see, it can be a little difficult to fully understand what's going on in these memories without a full resolution, non-distorted image. That said, I really, really hope that eventually all the fully completed images are released, because it would be a shame if we never got to appreciate the work that went into the backgrounds and overall composition. Infinity Train as a show feels like a moving painting, and every singular frame could probably be used as a screensaver. Appreciating the work put into the show aside, we still have a lot of references to get to, so unfortunately I can't sing its praise for much longer unless I want this video to be massive. This is where we get into more speculatory details, however, which is why I saved them until now. Ah, you insensitive! How dare you force me to relive those memories! Just returning the favor, lady! First off, in order to give context to these later details, we need to go back into the past car and point out an important detail and life event from Amelia's memories. We never get to see how Ulrich died, but we do get to see a frame of the moment where she finds out about either his death or something that happened to him. At 731 in the past car, we can see that Amelia is holding a phone with a shocked expression. This is one of the images that's hard to analyze because of the scene distortion, but it's obvious that this is one of the final scenes that takes place before she boards the train. We know this because in the episode The Engine, it's the final image in chronological order that flashes before she gets trapped in her tape a la Tulip Interference. There's further evidence to support that Ulrich died in a freak accident, and this is in the background details that we can see in the unfinished car. At 2.54, we see a hospital IV in the background of one of the turtles' houses. And seconds later, at 2.56, we also see a hospital bed. This exact bed is seen multiple times throughout the episode, but 2.56 is where we see it first. This adds to the evidence that Ulrich was in a sudden accident if he was rushed to the hospital and put on an IV. If the bed is in her memory, it means that she visited him while he was there. Additionally, she remembers that the bed number was number 4, implying she most likely visited him multiple times or spent a lot of time in that room while they were there trying to save his life. That sort of adds a lot of dramatic irony to this bitter statement from her in Book 3. One has no idea you exist, short pants. At least no more so than any of the passengers. In a very real sense, we're just numbers to him. Another small detail in support of Ulrich dying in an accident is the fact that the caution tape is covering the exit to the car. Caution tape is often used at accident scenes to protect both the injured and uninjured civilians, as well as give personnel such as police officers and EMTs undisturbed access to the scene. So while it could be that it's there because there's no door and it's an open space to be aware of, it does seem like a weird detail to include overall. It's heavily implied that cars only include supplies and items that fit with their theme, and there's no reason outside of this explanation that would explain its inclusion. I do have a theory as to how he died as that's located in the episode The Engine at the timestamp 525. There's a flipped over car that looks like a green 1980s Buick, perhaps implying that a car accident was his cause of death. But that's completely speculatory on my end and I'm not going to act like it's this timeline changing detail and therefore I'm not going to spend a lot of time going in on that. Kevin, always being seen with the phone, could be acknowledging that she was glued to the communication device when she wasn't at his bedside, always wanting to know his status and if there were any changes. I'm not sure if her mental state and her memories could affect that of an untargeted denizen, but it's implied that it's possible through Hazel. More on Hazel later though, because there's also a lot to unpack with her. Before that though, let me share this mind-blowing discovery that 
that I found with you all. I saved this as one of the last memory comparisons because I actually almost missed it. So in the unfinished car, we see shots of clocks multiple times throughout the episode. One is in a turtle's house, whereas the other is that big clock that I mentioned earlier with the whoopee cushion. Both of the clocks, seen at 326 and 344, are at the time 1256. Now this was seemingly just an interesting detail at first, right? The clocks in this world would be at the same time, obviously, because they're in the same place and time zone. However, an hour passes and it's still at the same time. Now you may be thinking, well duh, they're not gonna redo an entire background scene just to make the clock hand an hour later. And I thought that at first too, until I went back and watched the past car frame by frame. And wouldn't you know it, there's a clock they were also stuck at roughly 1256 or one o'clock. And where is that clock? At 6.46 into the episode at the time of Ulrich's funeral service. There's absolutely no way that this is a coincidence. And if it is, it's one hell of one. I have my reasons why I think it's like this, and I'm pretty positive it's because this is the exact moment that Amelia considered her life to be over. Because directly after this scene, she travels to her old university campus, where it's strongly implied that she intended on committing suicide. For a lot of people, the funeral is where things begin to feel real. Before someone is buried, it's common for the human minds not to process that that person is actually dead and that they'll never see them again. However, things generally begin to sink in for people once they actually see the person being buried. Everyone experiences major life events like this differently, of course, but it's common for this to be the moment where death sinks in and begins to feel like more than just a bad dream. I think that it had a similar effect on Amelia and that she was going to be forced to accept that Ulrich was dead if she watched him being buried. And it's heavily implied that she never actually attended his service and never actually said goodbye, which is partially the reason why she's perpetually been stuck in the bargaining stage of grief. And that brings us into Hazel. Now, Hazel is a unique case in that she does give us some answer to Amelia's past indirectly while also being her own individual person. She's Amelia's consequential creation from a failed experiment, but she's also technically the daughter of both her and her late husband. This is because she's intended to be a clone of Ulrich, but she actually shares qualities from both Amelia and her targeted template, such as her sharing Amelia's starting number and some of her memories. Appearance-wise, she also shares a combination of Amelia and Ulrich's clothing, Ulrich hair color, Amelia's number as mentioned previously, and a few similar facial features. She also shares memories and shared experiences with Amelia, further proving that she is just as much her as she is the late blonde. One of the easiest ways to prove this is located in the debutante ball car, after Grace asks Hazel what her parents are like, under the assumption that she's an ordinary human passenger. In addition to her not having any memories of her parents, she recalls that ballroom dancing is a fun bonding activity for couples, directly marrying a frame from the past car of Amelia and Ulrich dancing together at 727. Couples do ballroom as a fun bonding activity? Uh, yeah, I guess so. There's nothing to indicate that she would understand ballroom dancing outside of this, so it's heavily implied she's aware of it because of her shared memories with Amelia. This is evidence, as I pointed out earlier in the video, that proves that memory can have an effect on the behavior of created denizens, such as in the case with Kevin and the phone. But there's also more evidence to this, such as with smaller things like Hazel knowing what a TV and a couch is, as shown in the episode The Jungle Car. She also knows what tea is and how to make it, perhaps hinting at her knowing how to brew it because of her parents living in England, where it's the most popular popular beverage. Again, she doesn't really have a reason or way of knowing what these things are, outside of the knowledge that she has from her shared memories. And because Amelia lived in a house with a TV and couch, as well as England where tea is important to their culture, it's not far-fetched to say that Hazel knows of these things because of her creator. Another obvious point that this occurs is with her directly interacting with her quote-unquote mother. Amelia states that she isn't good at cooking, and Hazel then goes on to say, No, oh, you make the best pancake! It pains me to turn down my first compliment in 33 years, but we just met yesterday. This understandably confused the older woman since she literally just met her and made her eggs, not pancakes. But again, if we go back to the past car, we can see at 7.32 as seen where Amelia and Ulrich are making pancakes together. And if that evidence wasn't enough for you, there's one more that pretty much confirms it. When trying to convince Simon and Grace to allow her to hold a funeral for Tuba, she has this to say about it. It would be good for me to go! to a funeral. It helps to say goodbye. 
Because of the context that I mentioned earlier, it's implied that Amelia never went to her husband's funeral. Hazel being so insistent on needing to do one and saying it would be good for her to go to one, perhaps implies a memory of regret that Hazel has from Amelia. She never got to say goodbye since she skipped the service and then was kidnapped by the train, so understandably that wouldn't cause a great feeling. Hazel being so insistent on doing this could derive from her creator's feeling of regret and emptiness. However, it's kind of hard to tell where those feelings come from since Hazel is her own person. Her knowing about funerals does stem from Amelia's experiences, however, as she wouldn't have known otherwise. If she were a perfect copy of Amelia, she likely would have reacted much differently to the death of a loved one. This proves that she's her own person alongside a few other things, much to Amelia's dismay, but that's not the topic of this video. It's interesting to think about how a passenger's memories affect that of created cars and their denizens, because it has a lot more subtle effects than direct effects. Of course, it's obvious in the case of Hazel and her creator, but it may not be as obvious in the case of other passengers with their denizen companions. At least one that was based off of their memories, if this theory is correct. Like with Kevin and the phone, there was also a subtle detail of a turtle family at 519 in the unfinished car that could be a direct reference to Amelia's home life. I feel like I'm probably reaching here, but my explanation is that it seems like a really weird detail to include. Most other background scenes in this episode had something significant in it, so I feel like this scene does as well. I explain this way more detailed in my Amelia Feminism video, but I feel like this scene can be in reference to her childhood and how it probably wasn't the greatest. It's a seemingly innocent background detail at first, but a child playing with a toy train could perhaps imply a less than favorable memory since, you know, playing with a toy train could be seen as a boy-only activity in that time period. Since the stereotypical mother and father figure are both present, it could be that an uncomfortable conversation took place in the memory that this scene represents. I feel like if we ever ended up getting an entire book on Amelia, this would be a reference that would make much more sense in hindsight. But for now, I guess we're just gonna have to speculate on it and put it in the back corner. That's about it in terms of direct references, but I feel like it was enough to prove my original point. That being that the way the train works is it creates both cars and denizens based on passenger memories. I think that the denizens came after the creation of the car itself, but it still stands to reason that they're connected and one determines the other. It's very possible that Amelia assumed based off of train logic that if she created a car that was completely accurate to her old university campus, that the car would create him as well in direct consequence to its creation. It's honestly a super smart way for her to attempt to bring him back, though frustrating to the point of insanity as well. It would also make manipulating the train without one one himself possible, since as we saw in Book 3, passengers are able to extract their own memories while conscious and without the help of a porter. This would circumvent the need for the pessimistic robot entirely. And that brings us to the final portion of this video. Because of how close Amelia was to actually succeeding, would it have ever been possible for her to actually succeed in bringing her husband back from the dead? In short... No. She was running a fool's errand and likely would have died before succeeding. The main reason being, everything she was creating was based off of her memories. Life events, relationships, and interactions are remembered differently by everyone, and so Ulrich himself probably would recall certain scenes differently if you asked him to describe them to you. This includes things like the proposal scene or even simple childhood experiences. I'm sure that their shared memories were similar, but they wouldn't have been the exact same. You can't create a perfect replica of someone from your memories alone, because no matter how well you think you know and remember them, you'll never know them as well as they know themselves. You weren't there for every life moment that shaped them or important moments that they had before they met you. So if Amelia quote unquote succeeded, she would be creating an Ulrich based from her memories and not his own. His own life experiences wouldn't be included, and rather his experience through her eyes would be. And I think if she ever did succeed in at least creating him physically, she would probably come to realize very quickly that her so-called perfect creation didn't act like her late husband entirely, despite everything being perfect in accordance to her memories. But wow, this is just a lot to think about and consider. Not in a bad way, of course. I guess I'm just more impressed than I am anything else. The amount of detail and love put into this show makes it criminally underrated, and I still think that both HBO Max and Cartoon Network are foolish for canceling it. Maybe sometime in the distant future, we'll get answers to these questions if it ever gets a renewal, but unfortunately, it's going to be a very long time before and if that ever happens. But just because it's ending doesn't mean I plan on ending my discussions about the show, and you shouldn't either. If you want to see more Infinity Train analysis videos like this and keep the discussion going, why not subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of when I upload. Special thank you to my top tier patrons, Ambrose Rothwood, Rosie Knightley, Jeffy Games, Brandon Nunes, The Lovely Ghosty, Sudden Suzuki, Wade Taylor, and Zachary Ansley. Because of people like them, I can continue to make content like this. And I hope to see you all in the next video.
Have an amazing day, guys.